All right, well, welcome to the conversation on the TYT Network. I am so excited to have our next guest on. It's not an exaggeration when I tell you he's one of the living legends in this country. It's Reverend William Barber. Uh, he is the president and senior lecturer of the Repairs of the Breach, co-chair of the People's Campaign, uh, and has a new book called We Are Called to Be a Movement. Reverend Barber, uh, great to have you on TYT. Thank you so much. I'm always honored to be with you. All right. Uh, so, um, first off, for the uninitiated, what is the Poor People's Campaign? Well, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, is a massive, uh, intersectional, uh, multi-generational, multi-racial uh, movement uh, that focuses on five areas, systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. We began in 2018. Uh, we moved through with a series, 2017, excuse me, we moved through with a series of grassroots efforts and organizing, uh, permanently organized communities. We have over 45 co uh, state coordinating committees now. We are committed to all forms of challenge uh, uh, it, it, even nonviolent civil disobedience. Uh, we believe that the deep problem in America is the fact that we have 140 million poor and low wealth people, 43% of this nation, and we've not addressed it. We've not heard our politics address it. Too often the politics of poverty is either racialized by Republicans or, or um, run from by Democrats, and we need to deal with the reality of poverty. But you can't deal with the reality of poverty without dealing with the interlocking injustices. And just this past um, week, two weeks ago, June 20th, we had uh, the most, the largest gathering of poor low wealth people and their allies ever in the history of the nation. Uh, the Mass Poor People's Assembly Moral March on Washington Digital Affair. Over 2.7 million people joined just on Facebook alone. Uh, we had over 400,000 people to take action to send what we call our Moral Justice Jubilee budget and platform to every member of the United States Congress, as well as, as well as um, to every governor, uh, demanding fundamental shift and a third reconstruction, not from left and right and Democrat and Republican, but from a moral perspective. What is our deepest moral values and our deepest constitutional values uh, about justice and care for the least of these and providing for the common defense and the general welfare. So uh, I, I know you believe in civil disobedience because you got your MacArthur Genius Award while you were getting arrested a couple of years ago uh, doing civil disobedience. <laughs> and, and, and obviously, uh, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King uh, wanted to do the Poor People's March and probably would have been amazed at modern technology that wound up bringing those 2.7 million people together. Uh, but Reverend Barber, we, we do have a fundamental problem in this country. It's not just income inequality, it's the politics that led to that income inequality. Because as you gather up millions of people and you preach the gospel, and a gospel that liberals and conservatives agreed to, it's inarguable, it's in the books, uh, and the number one thing that Jesus says, and by the way, the Quran says, and, and almost all other religious books say, is feed the poor, help the needy. Yet, we do not do that. None of our politicians agree to do that. So what is fundamentally broken in this system and how can we fix it? Yeah, and you know, Dr. King, you're right, was beginning it, but people also need to remember that it was the National Welfare Workers, women, who pushed them to do it. It was the Jewish Federation, it was Cesar Chavez, it was indigenous people, they were all coming together, which is part of what we say in the Poor People's Campaign. We first have to change the narrative. Too often poverty is seen as those people over there. So one thing in the Poor People's Campaign we do is we put people's faces and voices in front of America. We're making America see herself. Sometimes we've had people pontificate on behalf of the poor, but they don't really believe in the agency of poor people. And they don't believe in counterintuitive uh, uh, narrators. So we put together the farmer from um, Kansas who may be white, the coal miner from Kentucky who may be white, with the black fast food worker from the Carolinas, with the Latino from California, with the Apache Indian from Arizona, and they're all coming together in this mighty coalition. We have to change the narrative. Second thing, the reason we have not seen politicians do it, because our politics have so devolved. 
since the war on poverty. We don't even talk about poverty. You think about it. We've had nearly 40 some debates since 2016 at the presidential level. And all you've heard is about the middle class, the wealthy, and then innuendos about what this person is doing, that person is doing in their personal life. But we've not addressed poverty. And when it is addressed, we use the wrong number. We talk about 39 million poor people rather than the 140 million poor and low wealth people, which is 43 percent of this nation. And then thirdly, we tend to sometimes it's racialized and we don't deal with the fact that 66 million of the 140 million poor and low wealth people are white. Now, 61 percent of all black people are poor and low wealth. So it disproportionately affects black people. But in raw numbers, it's more white people. And then we don't connect the dots sometimes. And what I mean by that, that racial voter, racialized voter suppression is targeted at blacks. But the people who engage in racialized voter suppression, once they get elected, they pass they pass bills against living wages and against health care. So they actually end up hurting more white people in raw numbers than than black people. But the target is African American. And then the final thing is we we have often not the political systems have not felt the power the political power of poor and low wealth people. You know, Trump won in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and um, and uh, Wisconsin by 102,000 votes. There are 2.1 million poor and low wealth people that didn't even vote. Many of the 100 million people that didn't vote in the last election are poor and low wealth people who don't vote either way because they never hear the politicians coming to them or talking to them or lifting up the issues. And so that has to change, which is why we are trying to force a change in the debate, change in the narrative and change in the power base. And then I think I would say, um, uh, lastly, it is a shame that we're not dealing with these issues. I mean, one of the things um, there's a, 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 a economist at uh, MIT, Otto Schwammer, and he says one of the greatest faults in our economic system today is conscience. We we have the resources. The lie of scarcity is a lie. But what we've not had is the conscience. We've engaged in too much attention violence against the poor. And it is it is literally shameful that we would allow 43% of our people in this country to go uh, to live in poverty. 700 people dying a day from poverty according to a study from Columbia University. And, and the attention violence is atrocious. And one of the reasons we have the attention violence is because both parties tend to be locked into this neoliberalism. And it's either, it's either, it's either uh, um, social Darwinism of Republicans, in other words, you give everything to the top and the trickle down, which is trickle down, or Democrats tend to think if you just take care of the middle class, somehow it'll fix things at the bottom. Well, that's not true. The reality is we need to loose ourselves from this neoliberalism and recognize that you, you can't just say all rising tides lift all boats if the boats got holes in them. <laughs> and, and a lot of boats, people's lives got holes in them because of disinvestment in community, because of racism in community, because of the lack of basic living wages. So you have to make sure the boats are right in order for the tides to lift. And that's why we believe in moral fusion and a moral understanding of economics uh, that chap that says what you know one of the things the scripture said you mentioned Jesus but there's another scripture that says woe unto those who legislate evil Isaiah 10 and rob the poor right in other words poverty is a choice 40 million 43 percent of this country is a choice and living in poverty is a choice people not having living wages is choices not personal choices and personal morality is public immorality and political immorality. So I, I do want to go one by one through the culprits, media, Democrats, conservatives, uh, et cetera. But before we do that, I, I want people to understand uh, uh, exactly what you're saying. So can I, can you emphasize two things for us? What, when you say 43% of Americans, what is your uh, cutoff for that? What is your threshold? What are you basing the 43% well, on? And then and what do you mean by attention violence? Mm -hmm. There are several studies that have said if you just take the baseline, the government baseline, what constitutes a person being in poverty, it says something like if you make a little bit over $12,000 as a single person, you're not in poverty. Well, we know that's not true because there's not a county in this country where working full time at a minimum wage job, you can, earn, you can afford a basic two bedroom apartment. So what we look at is another measure where it looks at pop level of poverty. Then we look at the number of people who are getting subsistence in various ways from the government. And, and we look at the living wage measurement. And we see living wage is around $15 an hour. 
now that we would look at. It should be higher because the minimum wage should be much higher than that if it had kept, rate, kept pace with inflation. And when you look at that model, uh, then you come up with 140 million poor and low wealth people or low income people, not just poor. Because because see, a person can be, they can be making it from paycheck to paycheck, but they're basically low wealth because they're only $400 away from major catastrophe. So you have to look at it that way. Attention violence is when you don't pay attention, as my grandmama said. So when we have all of these political debates, if, if anybody, I dare anybody to go back through all of the debates that have been held at the presidential level for the last election cycle, and even this one. Look at the primaries, look at the general. Find one debate where we spend an hour on poverty, or we spent 20 minutes on poverty and low income, or we spent a half an hour on racist voter suppression that allows people to get elected, who once they get elected, they prove that they not only believe in racist voter suppression, they also don't believe in living wages and they don't believe in health care. We've not had that kind of discussion. So that's a form of attention violence. It's almost a looking the other way or acting like we don't have to pay attention to it. That's why when we had the Mass Poor People's Assembly Moral March on Washington a few weeks ago, people were just calling and, and, and put going in the chat saying, I've never seen this. That we, we put people in front of people. They said, that looks like my uncle. That looks like my grandma. You mean to tell me a Kansas farmer is struggling the same way a, a fast food worker is struggling? The both of them were on the throne together. We had coal miners sitting right beside a black woman who named, who named Pamela um, Rush, who sadly just died the other day from COVID. But they were together in a hearing. This black woman from Alabama, this white coal miner, saying, look, we are facing all the same thing. These five interlocking injustices are hurting all of our lives. We've got, we have to change this picture. We have to change the narrative. And you can't change the narrative without changing the narrators. So uh, I, I want to give the folks a little bit of context to what Reverend uh, Barber is saying. So the federal minimum wage is seven dollars and twenty-five cents, which equals about fifteen thousand dollars a year if you work full time, forty hours a week. Full time, that's right. And and so even if you brought it up to fifteen dollars, it equals about thirty-one thousand dollars a year. And uh, and I've talked to teachers, I've talked to uh, serious professionals who cannot afford a two-bedroom apartment, just like William Barber said. Uh, and so it really uh, should be twenty twenty dollars an hour if you really look at over the years. Some economists have said that it should yeah. be twenty dollars. That's why Joseph Stiglitz said it's the cost of inequality. Not, for instance, if you raise the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour right now, you could bring over forty million people up out of uh, a low wage worker. Forty million with just going up to fifteen. You go up to a housing wage where they could actually afford a house, not rent somewhere afford a house is 73 million people, 70 some million people. And when we say living wage, we're talking about a used car and renting. We're not talking about, you know, sublurious things. We're not talking about extravagancy. We're talking about fundamental fairness. That's right. So Reverend Barber, uh, lots of culprits here. Uh, but when you talk about attention violence, obviously the first uh, uh, folks that come to mind is the media. Um, so when yeah. you talk about the debates, they didn't ask any of those questions. And when it looked like Bernie Sanders might win for a second, even the so-called liberal channel, MSNBC, flipped out with their anchors saying, oh, my God, they're going to drag wealthy people into Central Park and execute them. Mm -hmm. um, so how much responsibility does the national media bear in this attention violence and, and not paying attention to the 140 million Americans suffering? Poor, poor, poor pits in this country bear a burden. The media bears a burden because the way these uh, uh, debates are framed and, and the media oftentimes, just like right now, we're chasing around Trump as he's talking against monuments and talking against flag, and, and, flag and, and, and not paying attention to his economic policies that are hurting people, to all of the things that are being done underneath. We got to stop this chasing the firefly. We, the media has a responsibility to report on the reality of America and how in the world do you ignore 140 million people, over 50 percent of our children, 62 million people are making less than living wage. If that's not a story. And then when 2.7 million people come to here and join with the Mass Poor People's Campaign, how do you not talk about that 
in the midst of what's going on. But the, but, but the political systems are wrong because they don't deal with it in their platforms. They run from it as well. There's a lot of flame to go around. And even poor people are starting to say, you know what? It's time for us to say we won't be silent anymore. It's time for us to say we're not going to wait on them anymore. That's why we're going to have our own mass assemblies. And if we hadn't been, hadn't been for corona, we would have been on Pennsylvania Avenue. Yeah. But what, what, what we wanted to do, we couldn't just march because we needed the time to present these pictures and these stories and to present an agenda. But but we 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 all but the media, I think, has a lot to do with this, and the politicians and the political systems have a lot to do with it. And because they lie, then what I mean by the political system, when you start talking about dealing with power, they said first thing, well, we're gonna have to raise taxes. That's a lie. The money is in our bloated defense budget. We spend $800 billion a year in defense. If we cut our defense budget in half, we still have more money in defense than Iran, Iraq, uh, China, and um, North Korea combined. And we would have the money to do the things we need to do to ensure that we address the issues of poverty, even in the midst of coronavirus. This is the story. We passed three, three bills. McConnell and Trump wouldn't let them go through until 84% of all the money went to banks and to corporations. But I also challenged Democrats in the House. They should have put together a bill that was stronger, that made sure essential workers had the essential things they needed, like sick leave and unemployment and living wages and health care and guarantee on rent forgiveness and moratoriums on their utilities being cut off. And then let make McConnell have to cut it, but don't cut it for him. So we've got to have a different kind of boldness because we're leaving 143 million people without the things they need in this democracy. So Reverend Barber, uh, let's talk about Democrats. Um, so if if folks in, in that party wanted uh, to actually fight for these, you would be uh, the greatest ally they could have. Um, Poor people would be the greatest ally. Yeah, low wage well, folks, I've talked to you all over the country. Yeah, 140 million people would be a good ally in a, in a, if we were really living in a democracy. Uh, and uh, and certainly you would be. So do Democrats ever reach out to you and say, look, we want to help on these issues that you care about. And so help us uh, get to these results. Or do you never hear from Democratic leadership? No, we actually are starting to hear from them now because the poor people have said we are organized. In fact, after after we did six weeks of civil disobedience in 2018, we started hearing from them. Now that we've done this mass poor people's assembly, we're getting called back next week. We're doing a briefing with congresspersons who want to take our agenda and turn it into legislative, uh, to actually put bills to it. Now, we're not going to be fooled. We don't want just window dressing, right, because we're serious. But they're also starting to hear, you know, that we got a study coming out that's going to show how just 15 percent of poor and low wealth people were organized to vote. They fundamentally shift the politics all over the country. We have we, we are able to talk now about a third of all poor people live in the South, a third of all white poor people live in the South. And the number of poor and low wealth people that did not vote, they out distance, they outnumber the margin of victory by any candidate in the presidential race, the Senate race or the gubernatorial race. And so, and because we are organizing permanently organized communities, the politicians are knowing this core people's campaign is not just national. We have, you know, coordinating committees in every state and they're having to see their constituencies. And so it's beginning to happen. You know, it's not an easy thing for some of them, but it should be easy because this is about doing what's right. And we're going to keep pushing until, so I'm, 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 cautiously hopeful, but we got a long ways to go, but we're going to keep pushing and we're going to have a major impact. We're going to show the power of poor and low wealth people in this election season to let people know we're not going anywhere. Yeah, and the Democratic Party might get a lot more votes and a lot more people showing up uh, if they actually did serve the poor and low wealth <laughs> communities once they win, but they almost never do. Well, let me uh, get but to one thing, so since some of them may listen at this show. Trump won by 101,000 votes, as I said, in Pennsylvania and, and, and Wisconsin and Michigan. 2.1 million poor and low wealth people didn't vote. And many of them, as we talked to them, didn't vote because they never hear their name or their situations discussed. 
In the backwoods of Kentucky, I asked people in Harlan County, why did you all vote for Trump? Many of them said, we didn't vote. We just didn't vote. I said, why? They said, the last Democrat that came back here in earnest was Lyndon Baines Johnson at the beginning of the war on poverty. If Democrats will speak, stop talking this language, just middle class, middle class, and start talking about poor and low wealth people, say the word and then put policies in place that deal with that and lift from the bottom, they will see a fundamental shift. Uh, but you know, their consultants tell them, don't say the word poor. We talked to presidential candidate that he said it publicly, um, that president, the consultants tell them, don't use the word poor and poor people don't want to be called poor. Well, poor people tell us all the time, we are not offended by being called poor. We are offended in a nation that won't address poverty. That's what offends us. 100%. So uh, now, finally, let's turn to conservatives. Um, so look, I, I think that the Republican voters have a lot of issues, and I and I think that there is a significant racism and bigotry built into that pie, uh, and they will not break with Trump. Over 80% of them still support him. But on economic issues, they agree with you, Reverend Barber, and you see it in the ballot measures. So when they uh, went to increase minimum wages, they were even voting out Democrats in Arkansas and Missouri. Uh, minimum wage passed easily, 62% of Missouri, 68% in Arkansas. Uh, in Just a couple of days ago in Oklahoma, they passed a ballot measure to increase Medicaid, increase Obamacare. Uh, and, and so even the most Republican voters on economic issues are with you, Reverend Barber. Yeah, but I the politicians are not. And so what is going wrong that they are getting deluded into thinking that Republican politicians serve them when they do the exact opposite? Well, you know, Dr. King talked about this unholy alliance between the aristocracy and Southern politician, where they use race to get elected, but what they use, what their power once they get elected is to their corporate friends and to tax cuts for the wealthy. And what's got, what has to happen is we have to show people the connect intersection between racism and economic, um, uh, economic um, pain. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I've been saying right lately, if you look at a politician who's a racist, if you scratch a, my grandma used to say, if you scratch a lie, you find the thief. Where if you scratch a racist, you'll find a thief who will steal your health care, steal your living wages, steal your court, and who will give in to corporate interests and treating corporations like people and people like things. And so we have to show for people that 80% of the people in my state alone believe we need to have a living wage. I mean, the, the reality is when we start showing people what the cost of inequality is, people want to live, people need health care, people want their children educated. We know that in this country, though, there's all every time there's the possibility of black and white and brown people forming a coalition, particularly poor people, to change the political landscape, the aristocracy, the wealthy, so division. And that's a lot of what we see focusing with Trump now and, and the Republican Party. Now, I would tend to say this one thing. I don't normally call people conservative and liberal. I, I know that term is used. But because to be a true conservative means you would want to conserve the establishment of justice and conserve the uh, providing for the common defense and promoting the general welfare, which is the essence of our Constitution, equal protection under the law. What I say is let's change the language from liberal and conservative to talk about right and wrong, to talk about moral issues. And when we do that, I have found we went to Kentucky and we organized in five counties that were Trump counties. We never endorsed the new governor. We endorsed issues. And the governor that elect picked the governor that's just been elected picked them up. Three of those five counties flipped. Now we haven't had a lot of stories about that. But three of those five counties flipped. When the governor started talking about wages, Felony disenfranchised and felony disenfranchised and, and restoring health care. And these were the so called red counties. I believe people can flip and change if politicians have the courage to talk about these issues and then put together a plan. And we believe we have the plan. We believe it's the time. And we believe the people are recognizing that we are the movement. We are meant called to be a movement, not somebody else. We are called to be a movement and, and are starting to come together in powerful ways. All right. And in fact, the book is called We Are Called to Be a Movement. Uh, Reverend Barbara, I do not say it lightly. I really believe uh, one of the living legends in this country. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us on The Young Turks. Really deeply appreciate it. Thank you for having us. And I'd love to come back and go detail by detail through our platform with you and your listeners. Uh, let's, let's do it before the election. I would love to do that. Two easy ways to follow the Young Turks. One is hit the subscribe button down below, uh, then you're a TYT subscriber. And second is ring the bell. 
And when you do that on YouTube, you're notified of our videos.